Uh, good morning. The first item of business today is general questions. Um, I would invite members wishing to ask a supplementary question to press the request to speak button during the relevant question. The usual appeal for brevity in questions and answers. And I call question number one, Fulton McGregor. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what support is in place for people with long COVID. Mr Jenny Minto. Thank you, Presiding Officer. NHS boards are providing support for people with long COVID across local primary care teams, community-based rehabilitation centres and referral for investigation in secondary care settings where clinically appropriate. We are making available £3 million from our £10 million long COVID support fund over this financial year. Within the members' constituency, this funding stream is supporting the operation of NHS Lanarkshire's long COVID rehabilitation pathway. People can access the pathway following referral by their health or care professional. And the pathway is supported by a specialist team of professionals, including dietitians, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech and language therapists, and psychological practitioners. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that response. I have previously raised the plight of my constituent, Jonathan McMullen, in this chamber on a couple of occasions. Jonathan has been suffering from long COVID since he contracted the virus aged 14 in March 2020. His mother, Tracy, has worked tirelessly for her son, but the family have recently resorted to seeking private health care for his chronic fatigue and postural tachycardia syndrome that he was diagnosed with post-infection. It really does feel like we need to do more to help patients with long COVID. So can I ask what more can the Scottish Government do to understand long COVID and to ensure that those who develop such conditions like Jonathan has are effectively diagnosed and treated within the NHS? Minister. I thank Fulton McGregor for his question and would like to um, pass on to his constituent um, my, my sympathies for the difficulties that um, her family um, are experiencing. And I understand that my officials have written to Ms McMullen earlier this week in relation to Jonathan's case. The National Long Covid Strategic Network has developed a recommended pathway for the assessment and management of POTS for use by NHS boards and an educational webinar on POTS for healthcare staff across Scotland supporting people living with long Covid. We are working hard to implement our neurological care and support framework 2020-25 with a vision to ensure everyone with a neurological condition, including ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, can access the care and support they need. A couple of brief supplementaries. First, Jackie Bailey. Um, as we've heard, the Scottish Government has promised £10 million over three years for the treatment of long COVID. But in contrast, NHS England dedicated £224 million to support the assessment, treatment and rehabilitation of people with the condition. £90 million of that was allocated last year. That would have produced £21.7 million in Barnet consequentials for Scotland. So will the Minister tell us where the missing money, which her government has received, received has gone and will she allocate any additional funding to long COVID services in the upcoming budget? Minister. Um, there is no missing money. Um, the, the Scottish Government allocates um, the NHS funding uh, as, as appropriate to the needs of Scotland. And given that no one single service model would fit all areas of Scotland, we are giving NHS boards the flexibility to design and deliver the best models of care tailored to the specific needs of their local populations. I'm Ben McPherson. Officer, there is an in increasing amount of evidence of links between long COVID and ME, a disease which a number of my constituents and others feel has been neglected for decades. Therefore, on behalf of my constituents with ME and long COVID-related ME, can I ask the Minister for an update on specific actions the Government plans to take to implement the 2021 NICE guidelines on ME in Scotland, including specialist services, and when this will happen? Briefly as possible, Minister. I thank Ben McPherson for that question and recognise um, the importance of um, supporting people with ME and CFS. We inserted the, re the key recommendations from the 2021 NICE guideline on MECFS into the Scottish Good Practice Statement on MECFS and we published this on the Scottish Government's website in February this year. Thank you. Question to Liam Kerr. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to reduce the number of missed appointments in the NHS. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Officer, there are a range of initiatives being undertaken throughout the NHS to minimise missed appointments. For example, in planned care, the Centre for Sustainable Delivery is supporting boards to implement high-impact programmes, including active clinical referral triage and patient-initiated reviews, helping to reduce unnecessary appointments and eliminate waste. 
In vaccines, patients with a digital preference receive a reminder text or email of their appointment. NHS National Services Scotland uses analysis of patients' booking behaviours and habits to request non-attending patients' groups uh, book uh, directly, as opposed to being given timed appointments. Liam Kerr. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Now, last week, Caroline Hiscox, the CEO of NHS Grampian, told me a digital appointment system would be a solution in preference to the letters they're using at the moment. But this government's failure to properly resource the health service, the health board, makes it impossible for them to implement. So what steps is this government taking to allow NHS Grampian to implement these proper modern systems? And when can patients expect to see progress? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President Officer, we are providing record funding to our NHS boards to help to make sure that they can deliver the best possible services to patients as close to home as possible. In terms of communications with patients, the member may be aware that we just published our new NHS Scotland at Waiting Times guidance, uh, which sets out a range of actions that boards have to take forward, including uh, it provides for a standard package of communications that all boards should be using. The member will be aware that there are boards which do, do use, do use, make use of uh, digital services and we encourage other boards to do likewise. And I would certainly want to encourage NHS Grampian to do so going forward. Brief supplementary, Carol Mochie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, who did mention appointments close to home, given the countless stories of patients being asked to travel long distances, particularly in rural health boards, for appointments and there's not often the necessary transport infrastructure, what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure appointments are offered within communities close to home to reduce the number of missed appointments. Cabinet Secretary. As an officer, boards will try to provide appointments as close to home as possible. However, the member may be aware that there are, in terms of some clinical specialities, difficulties in being able to do that, where patients then have to travel to particular centres in order to access those services. But we would certainly want to make sure that boards are continuing to do what they can to deliver services as close to home as possible uh, and where that is clinically safe to do so. And of course, where there is travelling involved, there are travel schemes uh, provided so that patients can get reimbursed for the costs associated with their travel. Question three, Finlay Carson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it plans to accelerate new woodland creation in order to meet its targets. Cabinet Secretary, Mary Gujo. Over the past five years, Scotland has delivered 76% of the tree planting across the UK and we are committed to doing more. In June, I announced an action plan aimed at ramping up tree planting levels and I'm actively taking forward a comprehensive package of measures which will help boost woodland creation rates. And earlier this week, I introduced the most significant enhancements to the forestry grant scheme since it was established in 2015. Finley Carson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. Since the 1940s, Galloway has been subject to indiscriminate and damaging planting of huge areas of monoculture conifers to the detriment of our communities, our rivers and natural environment in what seems to be another mad rush to plant more trees. And tens of thousands of hectares will be planted in the south of Scotland next year. Only this week, despite uh, assurances to the contrary uh, that issues will be addressed, Scottish Forestry have approved the McIlston scheme without any satisf satisfactory arrangement with the residents at Kendon and Blackwater. How will the government address accumulative impacts on local jobs, biodiversity and culture? And will the Cabinet Secretary agree to meet with me and my constituents to hear their concerns? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I think, uh, well, no, I'm really glad that the member has raised this point. And I think we've always been very clear that ultimately this is about, uh, like most things and like most areas, it's about balance and ensuring that we try to get that balance right, that we are listening to communities. And I would say that that element of it is part of the, the package of improvements that I've also announced in terms of the guidance for that community engagement too. And we've always been clear that it is ultimately about the right tree in the right place. Because I think it's really important. We need to remember how vital our forestry sector is too in terms of the 25,000 jobs that it supports and it's worth £1 billion to our economy. But of course, our agriculture is important as well. And again, it all comes back to the, the balance in relation to that. If there are points that the member in particular wants to raise with me, I'm more than happy to, to follow up with them after this and to discuss that further. Question four, Bill Kidd. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has undertaken of the impact of the UK Government's autumn statement on NHS funding in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the autumn statement provided a real terms cut to NHS England and no funding whatsoever for 2024 25 for the cost of this year's pay deals or for the 2024 25 increases. 
It equates to less than 0.06% increase against the current Scottish health budget and means that there is at least £260 million of pay pressures on NHS Scotland for 2024-25. The UK Government must face up to the pressures across health and care and provide adequate funding to address the cost crisis that is hampering service recovery from COVID and also to make sure that we can support our health and social care staff in fair pay. Bill Kidd. I uh, thank the Cabinet Secretary for his reply. Uh, given the recent comments by Labour's Health Secretary calling for further privatisation and continuing Tory zeal for more austerity, does the Minister agree with me that the only party that can guarantee our NHS will remain in public hands is the SNP and that the, only, the full powers of independence to get rid of Westminster governments for good and the threat that they pose to our public services? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah. Well, Senior Officer, uh, health spending per head in Scotland is already higher than in both Wales and in <coughs> England. And my view is that rather than channelling precious public sector money out of our NHS and into the hands of private healthcare companies for profit, uh, we should be investing in our health service to make sure that we can provide first-class public services through NHS Scotland. And what I can assure the member and others in the chamber is that under an SNP government, uh, Scotland's NHS will always remain in the hands of the public and be free at the point of use. Supplementary, Jamie Hunker johnson the Rural GP Scotland Network has highlighted the impact of changes made in 2018 to the Scottish Workload Allocation Fund, which they say fails to re reflect the workload and services provided by rural GPs and their teams, and which has seen GPs in rural areas, many of whom in my Highlands and Islands region, actually losing money. So can I ask the Health Secretary, will the Scottish Government use its forthcoming budget to do anything to reverse these SMP cuts to rural GP funding? Cabinet Secretary. Well, sign officer, the, the member may be aware that the health consequentials from the autumn statement for uh, Scotland were £10.9 million. That's equivalent to five hours of our NHS in terms of funding. What I can assure the member of is that we have provided the commitment that was set out within the DDRB for the uplift for general practice, both for GPs and also for the staff group. And we'll continue to do what we can to help to support rural GPs, for example, through programmes such as the Scott Gem programme. But I can assure the member we'll continue to do what we can to make sure that we invest in our NHS going forward, both at a primary and secondary care level. And Beatrice Wishart. The blame for NHS deficits can't be solely attributed to the UK Government autumn <coughs> statement. The Scottish Government's mismanaged the situation for years now. Scottish NHS health boards are facing a forecast deficit of £395 million. Will the Scottish Government take responsibility and address the situation before patients and staff pay the price? Cabinet Secretary. Well, President, we have, uh, officer, we have already provided an extra £200 million uh, to our NHS boards to help to support them in meeting the financial challenges which they face. The member will be aware that our boards are also having to manage significant increase in costs uh, due to capital pressures and also, for example, energy costs, which are putting pressure on budgets as well. The additional £200 million that we have provided is to try to help to manage some of these things, which is why we are also engaging with boards to provide them with tailored support to help to address any financial challenges that they are facing. Question 5, Edward Mount. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made on enabling patients to access all of their primary and secondary care medical records from one source. Minister Jenny Minto. People can currently access certain parts of their medical records and while everyone has the legal right to access information held about them, this is not something which is consistently available on a national level. This is something we are determined to resolve and I know the Cabinet Secretary and First Minister have committed to address this in, public, in, policy, in the policy prospectus. We have now commissioned National Education Scotland to develop a digital front door which over time will begin to provide access. I expect the first version of this to be available by 2026. Edward Main. I thank the Minister for that answer. We are moving uh, painfully slowly. I have been trying since early last year to find a simple process for patients to have access to their primary and secondary health care records, records. Currently, as I found out to my cost, you require to submit a subject access request on GPs and also on all secondary care doctors involved in your treatment individually to get your records. 
Does the Minister agree with me that there should be a one-stop shop to allow patients to access their medical records? And what action will this government take to ensure that patients already facing the trauma of treatment do not have the additional stress of having hurdles put in their way to access their medical records? Minister. I, I thank Edward Mountain for that supplementary question and I know the hard work that you've been doing in, um, in this specific field of, of health, uh, especially the work you've done about Let's Talk About Health in, in Highland. I'm very happy to meet with Mr Mountain to further discuss this to see how we can move things on. Thank you. Question six. Pam Gosson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to reduce waiting times for post mastectomy breast reconstructive surgery. Cabinet Secretary Michael Mathis. Uh, firstly, I am aware that there are some extensively long waits for post mastectomy breast reconstructive surgery, and I recognise the impact that this has on women's health and wellbeing. Boards are currently prioritising patients with trauma and or active cancer, and delays have, of course, been exacerbated by the pandemic. We remain committed to reducing long waits and seeing a year-on-year -year reduction in waiting times. And we are taking this seriously and are working with stakeholders to ensure that we take further steps to address these issues. Pam Gosson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. After almost four years, my constituent has finally been given a date for a post-cancer breast reconstruction surgery. This is good news. However, raising individual cases in Parliament should not be the only route for women to receive a date for this crucial surgery. Part of the problem stems from Scottish Government directives on priority cases and the decision to cut surgery theatres at the Canisburn unit from six down to two. There are many more women on this waiting list, and there still will be, unless the Scottish Government tackle, tackles problems with plastic surgery. So will the Cabinet Secretary commit to producing a concrete plan for reducing waiting times so that women are not forced to endure this trauma for years? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Saying officer, look, I recognise the, the concern that the member raises on behalf of her constituent, uh, and I apologise for the extended delay that she's had in being able to uh, get access to the treatment that she uh, requires. Uh, what I can give her an assurance of is the work that we're taking forward in order to reduce long waits. So the member may be aware uh, that we've committed to investing an extra £100 million over each of the next three years to drive down our waiting list. That will help us to increase the number of capacity we have within tackling uh, waiting lists and will help to reduce numbers by 100,000 over the course of that three-year period, on top of the action we're taking at the present moment. And alongside that, the member might be uh, aware that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde are working closely with the Golden Jubilee Hospital to look at additional capacity provision, which will allow them to also make provision for additional plastic surgery capacity to address some of the extended waiting times that ex patients are experiencing. Thank you. Question seven, Ross Greer. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Technical error with that desk. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it is addressing the ticketing issues raised by the Cumbria Ferry Committee and Cumbria Community Council. Mr Fiona Hislop. I recently met with the member to discuss this issue and I've also written directly to the Cymru uh, Ferry Committee. Transport Scotland have previously noted the issue of season tickets which is being reviewed as well as wider issues on ferry fares. Options for an interim product are being considered including multi-journey tickets, however the R Tourist booking platform needs to be stabilised prior to further product introduction being considered. It's anticipated that CalMAC's stabilisation work on the booking platform will be completed later this month at the earliest. Ross Greer. Can I thank the Minister for that answer and for her engagement with myself and with residents on Cumbria. I wish I could say there had been the same quality of engagement from CalMAC themselves. The removal of the season ticket has resulted in a significant increase in cost for Cumbria Island residents, for whom this is a lifeline service and most of whom travel to the mainland every day of the working week. Island residents want to know more about the options being considered for the interim ticketing option in particular, but CalMAC have been unable or unwilling to provide any additional information on that or on any of the other issues that island residents have raised and which they expected were led to expect further information from CalMAC on. So can I ask the Minister if she would instruct CalMAC to engage with the community directly on the issue of the interim ticket and provide further information on the options being considered? Minister. Uh, as I uh, replied in my first uh, 
answer. I have already engaged uh, directly with the Cymru Ferry Committee on the number of the issues that they have raised. Uh, clearly, this community have previously been given assurances that this issue will be addressed, and I am keen that this will happen. Transport Scotland officials will continue to consider the options for doing so with CalMAC.